And good morning, good afternoon, good evening once again, and welcome to another segment of AJS 230, the police function. This week we're going to be talking about investigations. Now, investigations are a function of police work. However, as we've learned earlier, and we will continue to learn, most police departments do not, well, that's probably a little unfair. Uh, half of the police departments in the United States do not have a detective division or detective bureau or criminal investigation division. It goes by a million different names, and they all vary from agency to agency. But the fact remains that, near, that about half of the departments in the United States have approximately 10 to 12 officers full-time or less. And so this would barely cover a single patrol car for any for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if you decide to use the, an eight-hour plan. But there are still investigations that are done. So what does that mean? That oftentimes means that in most police departments, it's you're not going to have a, a detective bureau. You're going to be just like these fellows are in Missouri. They're going to be doing their own detective work. And that's going to be an expectation. Unfortunately, this is, this is one of the drawbacks of having a fragmented, decentralized police system like we have in the United States. As the, as the, the old saying goes, every dictator seems to want to have his own army. And so you end up with many small town police officers, or should I say many average departments, finding themselves in the position where their officers have to be good investigators or reasonably good investigators. And so just like these fellows are doing in Missouri, they're doing their own crime scene investigation work. This is an operational reality. And this is why it's important to have well-educated police officers that are capable of doing the work. Why? Because it's expected. If you keep telling too many citizens that, I'm sorry, we don't have a detective bureau, we are not going to follow up on your investigation, all we're going to do is take a report, how long do you think it's going to be before the citizens decide to vote their government out of office and get rid of their police? With that said, Most departments have learned that they have to be a lot more specific and focused about addressing crime. Gone are the days where you can simply take a report, draw a statistic, and make the citizens happy. Citizens have gotten have become far more sophisticated, and they're starting to expect far more from their police departments. Aside from that, the federal government is tired of throwing money at problems and they're going to want to see return on investment. So this means the way of doing things as it used to be is not going to work anymore. If it's still around, it won't be around for long. So as a result, new tactics have been developed. New ways of new procedures, new operations have been developed over the last 20 years. Look at things such as, such as CSI. How long has that program been on? been on television. Everybody's seen CSI. Everybody knows what to expect from the CSI, even though it's we all know that much of it is is hyperbole and uh, not factual. And so everybody expects it. But you have to do something. You have to do more than just take a report. And so we're going to talk about a number of some number of these operations as well as some other Operations that have been done for a number of years, including decoy ops, stakeouts, stings, and things of that nature. And in the smaller departments, patrol has to get involved. Patrol has to be the investigator. And so these departments have to be far more creative and far, far more smart at doing what they're doing. So let's look at how things were in the old days. In the old days, it used to be the patrol officers would just 
take a report and uh, move it, refer it to the detective bureau. The detective bureau will get to it when they get to it. In the meantime, if it isn't easily solvable, the detective bureau would typically just would simply close it out and say there's no further investigative leads. In the 1970s, the criminal investigation process by the Rand Corporation came out. And it seems as though back in that day, every chief, every sheriff, every uh, city manager, every, every city government official somehow got a copy of, of that study. And the study concluded that detectives didn't do a lot of didn't do a lot of investigation. Detectives then and and even when I was working seemed to be more concerned with boosting their image and getting promoted than they did doing their job. This was followed up by another study done by the Police Executive Research Forum in the 90s and it basically said things haven't changed. It's still follow-up investigation. It's still talking to people, taking reports, and following up on leads that oftentimes go nowhere. With that said, detectives, or rather researchers, believe that, that a detective's role is important, and it is. As I mentioned, in these smaller departments, it's a matter of getting to the next call, get, disposing of the call that you're on right now and getting to the next call. So somebody has to be available to do follow-up investigation. And so this is where a detective would come in. Like I said, the unfortunate reality is, is that many agencies don't have the ability or the manpower to have a detective bureau. So where, is, so where does this process begin? It typically begins with a patrol officer. The patrol officer is dispatched to a crime. The patrol officer takes the basic information from the complaining witness or the, or the crime victim, writes it up in his field notes, and then transfers that information to an incident report. This incident report in those agencies that have detectives is a crucial piece of information. If these patrol officers don't adequately protect the crime scene, don't make an accurate assessment, don't attempt to locate witnesses, the, the detective's job is going to be much harder. And this is where I this is where I think that small town departments, if you have a good small town officer, is much better than a large city police officer. There is an old saying in, in small town policing, and it's basically you catch them, you clean them. It's a, basically a hunting adage that's been adapted for for police work. And that is the patrol officer handles a case from beginning to end. And if he's good, then he has something to work with from beginning to end. And crimes are going to get cleared. Even if he works for an agency that has detectives, chances are the detectives will have plenty of work to do or plenty of leads to follow. And it's the more leads you have, the better leads you have, the more likely you are to clear that crime. So, after the officer's taken that preliminary report and hopefully has done a good job, what do the detectives do? They either solve or clear reported crimes. And here's what I mean by solving or clearing. Either they solve the crime, find out that, that a crime did happen, find and, and identify a suspect, apprehend the suspect, or at least develop enough information to get a warrant for their for the suspect's arrest. The other alternative is that the crimes are cleared, which means they are investigated as far as they can go. When there's no more investigative leads, 
the case goes inactive or closed. Detectives may process crime scenes. In a number of agencies, detectives are often required to attend a basic crime scene processing course. But it's like everything else. There are some people who are interested in it and want to do a good job, and others that don't. And those that don't tend not to do very well. They're supposed to con conduct a neighborhood canvas, although I think a patrol officer can do this just as well as anything else. The same thing with processing crime scenes. There are patrol officers who, who do a great job at, at processing crime scenes. In fact, that was one of them. And whenever there was a major crime against the person, I was taken from patrol and assigned to the detective bureau because they knew that whatever I found or whatever processing I do, it's thorough and they will end up with a conviction. With that said, some of these bureaus may be decentralized or centralized depending on, on the agency. And the ultimate goal, of course, is conviction. The ultimate goal is to bring in enough information to that so that the prosecutor can win the case relatively easily. Because as we all know, more than 80% of cases are solved by a plea bargain. And so if, if you deliver the prosecutor a strong enough case where he can win it in a walk, he's happy. And of course, there's a little something called the detective mystique that goes along with it. And this is why a lot of patrol officers will often try to become detectives because they see they see the detective as something of the glamour boy or the hero of the department. They're the ones that solve cases. They're the ones that that uh, are the are the people you call to to make things happen. They tend to work out of uniform. They work in plain clothes. They're in unmarked cars. They don't respond to to family fights and barking dog calls. But what people fail to realize is that these are that detectives require some very different skills. They have to be able to talk to people. They have to learn how to how to get the confidence of people so that they can provide them with information. They have to learn how to process a crime scene and to do it effectively. Of course we've also have our fair share of fictional detectives uh, starting even as early as the 1800s. You had Sherlock Holmes, who was a fictional detective. Uh, Fearless Vosdick was a uh, was a fictional detective in the 20s and 30s. And there's a whole host of them today. Starsky and Hutch was, was in my era, which kind of dates me a little bit. They were considered as, as the super cops. And so a lot of people see those fictional depictions and they figure that's what detective work really is. And it often isn't. Now, if you don't have detectives, what are some alternatives? Well, you do what a lot of agencies do or have to do. You use patrol to do in investigations. And you also appoint investigative specialists whose secondary job is to conduct these conduct crime scene investigations, to collect and process fingerprints, to identify using, using fingerprint databases and examinations who these suspects may be. In fact, this was, this was how my job evolved over the years. It used to be I was I was the go-to guy when I, when it had to do with crime scene or physical evidence or investigation. And finally I was appointed as an investigative specialist. The department in fact the department I worked for after I left to uh, work for a larger agency began to uh, appoint specialized investigative specialists. I was the first one I was the de facto investigative specialist. But now the department has actually formally recognized it and provided it with training and status.
So when we last left off a few moments ago, we were talking about some alternatives to uh, using detectives. And as we said before, most departments simply don't have the manpower luxury to put people on full-time detective status. And so the officers have to pick up the slack. They have to do this for themselves. And in about half the departments, this is going to be an operational reality for you. So what needs to happen is that officers need to, need to be directed as to what they should be doing. Now with that said, typically most police academies don't spend a lot of time dealing with investigations. Now there are some few, there are notable exceptions. Uh, my, my academy that I went through, we were fortunate enough to have an instructor who was a identification officer at Detroit PD. And we were fortunate enough to actually do a lot of investigative training. Now, in other departments, that simply isn't the case. And so what has to happen is officers need to be directed to perform certain investigations. They have to not only... Not only do we have to have ex expectations where if, if an officer is dispatched to an investigation that he is to do certain things like an every canvas, get complete uh, crime information and so forth, but he also needs some kind of training. And some of this may be obtained through a mentor or it may be obtained through some formalized training either at the academy or in service training after the academy. Generally speaking, the, these expectations and priorities are in writing, or at least they should be, because if, if you're going to be disciplining people or at least counseling them that they're not performing to standard, you need to have those standards in writing. And we've already talked about how some officers actually have become investigative specialists. And departments should encourage that, especially the small ones. They should be encouraged to have officers uh, working secondary assignments as investigators or, or identification specialists or things of that nature. Because it does a couple of things. Number one, it actually recognizes what they do. And secondly, it serves as incentive. By incentive, these guys are, are now able to go to certain training functions and actually get additional training, which would normally cost the, the department an exorbitant amount of money. For example, the International Association for Identification has a chapter in the state of Arizona. And in order to, to join, you have to be, or your your job has to involve forensic identification. Now, in a small to police, police department, it just doesn't happen. But if the officer in that same small to police department is recognized as an investigative specialist or an identification specialist, that will allow him to go to these meetings and get better training. While officers are actually performing investigations, there should also be some management of criminal investigation because it doesn't make a lot of sense to spend a lot of time or a lot of department resources on an investigation which will probably, will, probably will not go anywhere. And this means checking the preliminary report for solvability factors. In other words, do we have witnesses? Do we have physical evidence? Do we have traceable uh, stolen items. These are, these are what are typically factored in when we're looking at solvability factors. Cases should be screened for those and those with the highest solvability factors should be, should receive further investigation. Ultimately, you need to, you need to 
to talk with your prosecutor, and we're going to see later on how police and prosecutor coordination serve to lower the uh, incidence of crime by getting habitual criminals off the street. And of course, as I mentioned before, we talked about how officers are going to require some training and mentoring. If an officer is, is mentored by an, another officer who has a certain level of criminal investigation training and experience, they can share that information that, that they learn and actually improve investigative productivity. An example of which was at a larger department that I was working at. I was a field training officer and officers that were assigned to a field training officer either got me for a rotation or they at least had me for a week of that rotation where I would provide information as to how to conduct a proper crime scene investigation or how to conduct proper uh, follow-up investigation and so forth. With that said, one of the thing one of the things that's coming up is intelligence-based policing. And this is where we're using intelligence and using it to deploy people and solve crimes. So with that, I'm going to I'm going to turn our direction or turn our attention rather to a video from the Cape Coral Police Department that describes intelligence-based policing. Recently, I did a news release uh, where a detective bureau made multiple arrests on vehicle burglaries and some arsons, and I alluded to a concept that we uh, prescribe to here called intelligence-based policing. And what intelligence-based policing is, the uh, best way for me to describe it would be an analogy. And everybody uh, knows what a standard uh, bathroom looks like in America. You have a sink, a mirror, um, a toilet, and either a tub or a shower. And if you were given the task of cleaning it with the lights off and you couldn't see, you could fumble your way through it. And if I turn the light on, you could do a much better job. And that, in a nutshell, is how I equate intelligence-based policing versus the old-fashioned shotgun approach, where you just go out and go get it. And how that relates is, in the days um, prior to probably 2002 or 2003 here at the Cape Coral Police Department, we would... Um, gather intelligence, uh, very rudimentary, and for lack of a better word, go out after our, our roll call or our briefing and talk about some of the crime trends and go to our areas and try to clean them up uh, with the lights off, right, if you relate back to that earlier story. Since 2002, when we really modernized and computerized our uh, crime analysis unit, they're able to gather things much more timely uh, at the click of a mouse or a push of a button the old-fashioned sharing with our detectives who interview people, the patrol officers who are the eyes and ears on the street, and that last component that's often overlooked are those relationships that you build with the citizens. When those are all put together, that is essentially turning the lights on. So when you go out to clean up a neighborhood or, or uh, police a zone, if you will, you're able to do it much more effectively, like that story I told you in the beginning, of cleaning a bathroom with the lights on. You can see what you're doing, you're a little bit more guided and focused, and the results, I believe, speak for themselves. Um, to begin with how intelligence-based policing evolves, we'll go through an A to Z flowchart. And the first uh, peg on that would be a series of crimes that are related. And how do we know they're related? Officers respond to a, to a scene. Uh, we'll take a burglary ring, for example. A couple of burglaries occur. Uh, some unlocked vehicles are hit in a neighborhood. Our officers will go out. They'll take an initial report. And in that report, they'll detail the method of operation. Was it unlocked? Uh, did they leave anything behind? Did they target specific items, specific times of the day? Any type of similarities. We'll get statements from victims, witness uh, statements on a canvas, and put all of that intelligence together on a police report, and it gets submitted. That police report goes in two different directions. It goes to our crime analysis unit, 
to really drill down and get uh, a lot of those factors that I just spoke of. And the other direction it goes is to our investigations unit, where they will actually start to uh, put feet on the ground and, and try to solve these cases. Well, what we do when we get enough of those is patterns start to emerge, times of day, days of the week, um, different, uh, a picture starts to come in into focus, if you will. And rather than sit on that information, we share that with the police officers that are out on the street, that are out patrolling anyway. But if they're given a little bit of a direction or a heads up as to where something might be happening or who to, to look for in a particular area, you start to see results, and such as we had this past week, where our officers were in a particular area, based on this intelligence that we've been collecting and gathering, and that picture's coming into focus, and that last piece of information, that relationship that we have, where the citizens know to call us when there's anything out of place, they did that, within minutes we had these suspects caught, and we solved dozens of burglaries that way. Now, the Cape Coral Police Department uh, was an agency that I did a lot of work with when I was in Florida. In fact, uh, I actually lived right across the bridge from Cape Coral and had a number of uh, Cape Coral police officers working for me. And that's basically what intelligence-led policing or intelligence-based policing is, where we learn who who's doing what in the neighborhood and we share that information with patrol and detectives. Now, one of the things that it made reference to were, were things called zone books. And a lot of agencies would off, would not necessarily have official zone books, but instead, uh, a lot of agencies would have unofficial zone books. And this is where officers would maintain their own records as to who was doing what and where they could be located in their particular patrol zone. Now, in some places, like some of the suburban Detroit departments, uh, many of these zone books were, were actually uh, valuable. So valuable, in fact, that when an officer either retired or uh, was promoted or reassigned to another bureau, many of these zone books ended up uh, going to the highest bidder. And the officer that was taking over that district knew that he could get a lot of arrests and a lot of good convictions based upon that information in the zone book. But today, we're sharing that information with officers or with, with other parts of the department. At least we hope to be doing that. Uh, some places, eh, probably not so much, but we're hoping to make it to change that up just a little bit. Now, what we're really talking about is, in, is information management, which means getting the right information to the right people. And if we can get the right information to the right people, this can often enhance and strengthen investigations. Uh, especially if the detectives are working on something and, and the patrol is working on something and they both come up with different information, if they can somehow fuse that information together, then they can they can make an effective case sooner. And the information, of course, comes from a number of sources. As I mentioned, the detectives and the officers are your primary sources, but you also have information from citizens, informants, social media, uh, stuff that comes in on Amber Alerts. And if this information gets to the right people at the right time, then we can end up with with more incidents prevented and less crimes actually occurring. Why? Because then we can direct our people to where they need to be. Now it's true that officers can't be everywhere at once. With all due respect to O.W. Wilson, we try to make it look that way. But the reality is, is that, is that most, generally speaking, about 80 to 90 percent of your incidents are perpetrated by 10% of your people. So if you put your people where those offenders are, you'll do a lot more good. 
And we're back. This time we're talking about multi-agency task forces and how they fit into an investigation. Typically speaking, a joint or a multi-agency task force, in fact, if you were to look at the FBI's uh, raid jacket, you'll see some of this says JTTF on the sleeve and, and on the left chest area. That actually stands for Joint Terrorism Task Force. When a joint terrorism task force is formed between usually federal and, and state assets, what usually happens is that you have multiple agencies at all levels of law enforcement working on a particular problem that is common to a number of different agencies. And so what they will do is they will combine their efforts because they we all know that criminals cross jurisdictions. They go from one city to another city and so forth and continue to perpetrate. Now an example of which is human trafficking. Human trafficking in, in Michigan, at least when, when I was familiar with, involved people that would come into Michigan because we do share a border, international border, and they will often find themselves in either sex trafficking or in some form of involuntary labor. And what these what will happen is is that a local agency will hear of something that's going on and it's usually the end of it. But with a multi-agency or joint task force, then that local agency has a place where that information can go and can be acted upon. The nice thing about working in a joint task force is that you actually take on the jurisdiction of the highest level uh, investigative agency in there. For example, when I was working with a uh, with an, a drug task force in the Lansing area, our drug task force coordinator was the Drug Enforcement Administration. So while I was on that task force, I was actually a DEA agent, which is helpful to have because as while the federal government brings in a number of resources, one of which being a broad area, and two, probably the most important, a lot of money, they don't have local level information. And so by combining that local level information from multiple jurisdictions, we end up with much better outcomes. Now the examples they, they mention, of course, is the Blue Campaign and WASH Act, which is uh, two initiatives dealing with human trafficking. There are many, as I mentioned, there are many others. Uh, there are gun task forces that were in operation in Detroit for a very long time. And, they, and as far as I know, we're still in operation. Drug ta task forces go on continuously. And, of course, the current flavor of the month, for lack of a better term, is terrorism task forces. So with that said, let us shift our attention a little bit from multi-agency task forces to repeat offenders. How do we deal with repeat offenders? Well, let's take a look at how one community in Florida is currently dealing with their repeat offender problem. where one police agency is now targeting those criminals who constantly target others. News Channel 5's John Shaman is part of the largest news team on the Treasure Coast. He has more from Port St. Lucie. Do you remember this story from last month? Shoplifting. What did he use of stealing? Well, personal. A St. Lucie County man arrested for the 100th time in Port St. Lucie after stealing underwear. Sounds silly, but police say it's part of a serious problem. Now it's Detective T.J. Shirley's job to go after these kinds of criminals. These individuals that tax the system, whether it's Port St. Lucie Police Department, the uh, court system, state attorneys. Shirley unspools the long criminal history of a now 18-year-old. A petty theft arrest at 14, then a dozen more arrests a few years later. Well, basically what we're looking for is somebody that is truly habitual, somebody that... Uh, in layman's terms, just doesn't get it. If someone's arrested at least 10 times, they now get on Sherla's radar. 
That way he can help prosecutors when one of these faces ends up in court. We as an agency have the ability to bring this information to the state attorney's attention, uh, to the judge's attention. Right now, 10 adults and juveniles are on the detective's watch list, if you will, and 16 adults and juveniles have already been through the system. Of those 16, seven have received enhanced sanctions, whether that's being sent to a juvenile commitment program or being sentenced to more time through the Department of Corrections. Chief Brian Ruther says this program is just one of many the city's using to attack crime from different angles. As for the man with 100 arrests, he doesn't live in Port St. Lucie now, but if he moves in, there won't be a welcome basket from Detective Sherlock. In Port St. Lucie, John Shaman, WPTV, News Channel 5. And what the Port St. Lucie Police Department is doing, what a number of other agencies are doing at the same time. And what they're doing is they've realized that the vast majority of crime is usually perpetrated by the same 10% of all offenders that are contacted by any given police department. And so what they do is they focus their investigative efforts on these repeat offenders. And if these repeat offenders come into contact, then they are going to be followed up for further sanctions. They will then become an investigative priority. Once that happens, then the state attorney's office, and that's that's Florida's term for county attorney or prosecuting attorney. That's what they do. They handle all the criminal cases. They, in turn, will then make these cases a policy case. No longer will they get the bargain basement plea bargain. And instead, what they're going to get is time and lots of it. So with that said, let's take a look at Internet registries and how they assist investigations. Now with that said, internet registries take the same information that is available to law enforcement and or at least similar information and make it available publicly. Now there are certain parts of law enforcement related information that is, believe it or not, a matter of public record. It is, for example, a matter of public record when someone is is arrested and lodged in jail. It is also a matter of public record when that person is convicted. Doesn't matter what crime, they're convicted, it's a matter of public record. And through various special legislation that is that has been enacted over the last 10 to 20 years, some of those crimes are not only a matter of public record, but they are often publicized. For example, sex offender registration and sex offender notification in many states is mandatory. Sex offenders must notify law enforcement as to where they're living at any given moment. If they are homeless, and many of them are, they are required to check in with law enforcement periodically. Failing to do that, a, a felony warrant would be issued for their arrest. And so this information goes into a publicly accessible, internet accessible registry. And the idea is to track where these offenders are, what they're doing, and make people aware that these people may be living in their particular community. If something were to happen, the idea is, of course, is that, is that the public would notify the police. Now, there are, of course, some concerns that this may tend to create a false sense of security. But, again, these there's another possibility that, that these registries may be utilized to take some extra, shall we say, judicial action against these people. There, Like I said, there are incidents of this, but there isn't any any really scientific evidence to back up a lot of these things. But the bottom line is, is that people still need to maintain a certain level of vigilance to make this investigative tool work. Another investigative tool that is often used by law enforcement and is occasionally used is GPS technology, smartphones, and social media. 
GPS and smartphones can be used to monitor the whereabouts of certain people, especially offenders. Now, oftentimes offenders will will be required to utilize GPS so that their their movements and whereabouts can be tracked 24 hours a day. If they are outside of where they're supposed to be, the offender may get a text message. However, this comes into play after conviction. In investigative circumstances, GPS and smartphones are usually permissible or can be monitored if there is a warrant that's authorized. And typically we're talking about something that's that is a warrant authorized by the U.S. Attorney's Office and Federal District Court, and that usually involves a, a crime of a certain amount of national importance or multi-agency importance. And this is where your multi-agency task force can get involved. Usually they have somebody from the, from the U.S. Attorney's Office assigned to that task force, and they in turn can assist law enforcement in obtaining warrants to monitor an offender's phone and his text messages. With that said, pictures and videos from smartphones often end up in social media, and social media can be exploited by law enforcement, and in many cases it has. One of the examples that, that I'm aware of involved a couple of individuals who were involved in gang activity, and they would routinely uh, show off with money and guns in their immediate possession. Now, once we found out who they were, which doesn't which doesn't take a whole lot, and it's, and it's something outside the the scope of this course. Once they put it out on social media, it then becomes publicly accessible. There's no worry about getting a search warrant. Uh, there's there's some things that are done uh, behind the scenes by by law enforcement, a warrant is eventually issued for the arrest, especially when these people have been arrested before and convicted before on felony charges, and here they are with drugs and guns in their possession. So once, once the picture comes up in court, typically speaking, the defense attorney makes a plea bargain rather quickly. Some additional technology that is currently in use by a number of law enforcement agencies is, well, the slide says it's surveillance cameras, but it's more or less surveillance in plain sight. The idea is, is that these cameras are often posted in various areas that are often, that are, that are accessible to the public or on public property, uh, such as utility poles and so forth. The European police agencies, especially those in the United Kingdom, are pioneers of this sort of thing. But it's not out of the realm of possibility where a small agency, especially one that is not operating 24 hours a day, could use cameras like these and place areas under surveillance. Since it is out in the open and it's out in where there is no expectation of privacy, in other words, public areas, there are, there are no vi no one's rights are being violated. The four, no one's Fourth Amendment rights are being are being abridged as a result of using these cameras. Essentially, if someone could take a picture on their cell phone of you in the middle of in the middle of the street, so can a surveillance camera. And so a number of cases are being closed because, especially in smaller cities where there's fewer officers available, those cameras are always running. And all it takes is to run the video back to where the crime occurred and use that information to, to uh, effect an arrest. Another, I guess, another source of these videos is oftentimes YouTube. People often put up YouTube of what they see in various places. That is used as evidence as well. 
And we are back. We we left off talking about surveillance cameras. And this is really more of a misnomer. It's more of a overt observation camera, I guess. Because surveillance tends to imply that that you're doing something secretly. And there's really nothing secret about some of these cameras that are out there. In fact, most of them out there are just added to a light to pole or a telephone pole and are used to observe things when the police are simply not around. Now, there's also people who put in their own cameras and record video and, and post them on YouTube for others to uh, peruse, especially if there is a crime and, and nobody knows who the perpetrator is. With that, let's turn our attention for a moment to cold case squads. Cold case squads are something you're not going to find at, at your average police department. You're usually going to find a cold case squad at a larger agency, one that has the ability to uh, devote people and money towards the solving of cold cases. Now, cold cases have typically not received a lot of attention. Although some of the smarter appointments, what they will do is when a new detective uh, is appointed to that bureau, that detective will often be assigned a cold case to review. And in many cases, these cold cases, a new set of eyes uh, examining an old case may come up with something new. Uh, it could be that there is some DNA technology some DNA that's floating around out there that can be processed. Now in the old days, pretty much when I started working with DNA in the in the mid 80s to 90s, you needed a lot of sample to get any sort of DNA profile. DNA with a short tandem repeats that are currently in use don't require a lot of sample so we can so all these samples that are previously considered too small to be of investigative value are being looked at again. And these DNA samples are being sent in, they're being processed, we're getting, and we're getting CODIS hits that we don't usually get. Now, oftentimes there's a change of heart over the years because people are starting to realize that here this person has been allowed to get away with a crime for so long that the police should be doing something about that. And so this is why the cold case squads are starting to, uh, or at least the cold case reviews by, by new detectives, are becoming more and more popular, especially in the larger departments. Now, a rather innovative idea, which might be of use to some of these typical small departments, are various cold case societies that civilians are getting involved in. In fact, uh, a national cold case society approached me several years ago to establish a cold case chapter in our area. And my response at the time was that it was not right for that sort of for that sort of society. And at the time, there wasn't a lot of uh, student interest, but perhaps that may change. We'll see what happens. But that's one of those innovative ideas where civilians are actually looking at cold cases and coming up with some rather new things or, or some rather new ideas that eventually result in the closure of the case or a suspect being identified, that case being not just going cold, but closing. With that, let's shift our attention to another form of investigation, and this is the decoy operation. Decoy operations are essentially involving people that look like or act like or appear to be a, a potential crime victim. These were used a lot in the in New York in the 70s and 80s, uh, the Detroit Police Department 
used a similar decoy operation as part of the uh, stress unit, which was an acronym for Stop the Robberies, Enjoy, the, Enjoy Safe Streets. And the idea was you would send out a decoy, they would be victimized, and your backup team would, would then intervene and make the arrest. Unfortunately, a lot of these decoy operations have kind of fallen by the wayside. And you end up with a, with a situation where uh, these tactics often are not, are not looked upon well in the media. For example, the reason why Detroit no longer has a stress unit is because many times these officers that were part of the stress unit uh, logged a lot of injuries to suspects. Now, whether or not the suspect brought this upon himself or whether it was the officers merely inflicting a little payback, I don't know. It's hard to say. But a lot of, a lot of cities are very hesitant to go back to decoy operations. With that, let's take a rather humorous look at probably at a decoy op or rather at a operation that goes hand in hand with decoy operations, and that is, and that particular thing is the stakeout. And so we're going to look at one rather humorous way of how not to do a stakeout. some good news and some bad news for you here. Uh, we just got the orders through. I got you some help on that surveillance you guys are working. What's the bad news? Uh, the bad news is... Hey, Buck Savage here. Say, Sarge, I'm here to help you guys buy some illicit drugs. But before we go on any exciting warrants or heavy-duty surveillances, do I have time to get an ear pierced and maybe a tattoo? Uh, Buck, I'll wait in the other room. I'll be with you in just a minute. Huh? Okay, I'll get it done. No problem. Buck who? Say, isn't Buck supposed to be on the house? Yeah, he's supposed to be. And all right, I think you better check find out where he's at, please. All right, no. You know one, Buck Savage. Buck Savage, go ahead. You in position yet, Buck? Not yet, but I'll be there in a heartbeat. Yeah, that's all you need, Jesus. Okay, bad guy, we got there now. Oh, I can't believe it's out. Black, not in front of the house. Get out of there. Look at that, he's the other one. He's here, yes, he's here. What are you talking about? He's here. It's a pizza truck. <laughs> Pizza for Savage? That's right, Buck Savage, State Narcotics. You know, it's a long, hot, thankless job out here. I don't suppose there happened to be a police discount on this pizza. You're right, there wouldn't. Okay, great. Look, that's okay anyway. I have undercover funds. Here's a 20. Keep the change. 20? Gee whiz. Thanks. No problem. Buck Savage to all units. He's going mobile. I'll take the eyeball. He's on the wrong car. Let him go. Just let him go. Buck Savage to any unit. Say, you guys want to take the eyeball now? Think I've had it a long time now. Say, you guys are doing a good job. I, I can't see any of you. You guys are really covert. Stakeouts are probably the most expensive form of investigation there is. And you can see that they're, they're oftentimes labor intensive and time intensive. And the last thing you want to do is to pull a, pull a stunt like Buck Savage did. Now, the idea behind a stakeout is that 
you have you're watching a location you're basically waiting for something to happen and you're looking for patterns when does this person go out and perpetrate and I've been on literally thousands of hours of stakeout when I worked in in Detroit it is extremely expensive and to do it correctly you need about six guys six cars and to follow somebody around. So this is why stakeout operations are not usually used uh, unless the individual is a high value uh, suspect. And they're oftentimes very controversial, especially in some of the stakeouts that, for example, stress was involved in, the New York City Police Anti-Crime Unit was involved in. But probably the most controversial of all was the new rather was the Chicago Police Department stakeout squad and this involved a couple of detectives Jim Sorello was one of them and I, and I believe his autobiography is in print where the idea was you put a couple of detectives in a robbery prone area they sit and hide and watch until a armed robbery occurs and then they basically shoot the individual uh, because the situation has often reached the point where it becomes a shooting situation. And part of the controversy is, is there something else could, that can be done? Unfortunately, you have two situations with that. Number one, the individual wants to commit the robbery. He really does. And secondly, because the way the law is, you have to wait until the individual is committing the crime before you can actually stop them. And so that, as I mentioned before, in the Chicago Police Stakeout Squad, a lot of, a lot of perpetrators got shot and killed by Chicago PD. And a lot of gunfights occurred. And occasionally, in, Innocent people got caught in the crossfire. So, stakeout operations require a lot of planning. They oftentimes result in absolutely nothing happening, and they tend to be extremely expensive. Now, part of, part of a stakeout operation could very well be a sting operation, and this is where officers are posing as criminals. And there have been a number of, of uh, sting operations that have been conducted through the years. One such operation that I'm familiar with involved a joint uh, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and police uh, sting operation, where the idea was a pawn shop was set up, and the idea was they were they let it be known in the criminal world that that they are in the business of buying and selling stolen property. Now, the reason why the ATF was involved is because they were looking for stolen guns. And as one ATF agent once told me, that he, that he came up with more stolen guns and more illegal guns in the city of Detroit than he ever did in his entire career throughout the ATF. Now, with that said, the idea was you set up an operation, you have everything audio and video recorded, and the idea is you're, you're engaging in, in deception. You're not saying, hey, here we are, the police, we're here, we're here to, uh, to uh, investigate and find out if you're in the stolen goods business. But you supply an opportunity. You deceive the, the offender, and ultimately you end up making an arrest because the offender takes the bait. And there, there's other sting operations. Narcotics is another popular sting operation. There's a number of different things. But mostly it's stolen property and drugs that, that usually occur. Now, oftentimes the defender may, may say that he was entrapped by the police, but given the audio and video recording that it go on, and it provides 
strong evidence that this individual engaged in a pattern of behavior. And all they did, all the police did was provide an opportunity. Now, a trend that's beginning to come up in crime is, of course, cybercrime. And cybercrime would be loosely defined as, as crime that is perpetrated or enhanced, rather, through the use of technology, usually computers or some other computer-based device. And cybercrime often takes a number of forms. Our book identifies, of course, fraud, uh, virus transmission, and identity theft as three forms of cybercrime. But probably the, the one that is perpetrated the most and probably investigator close the least is the use of computer networks for threats and harassment or cyber stalking. There is a lot of advantages to it from a criminal perspective. They can pretty much engage in cybercrime wherever they want, and many of them do. Many times I, I've dealt with people that have perpetrated cybercrime from the public library using their free Wi-Fi, coffee shops, uh, any place, a Starbucks, any place with free Wi-Fi is a, is a good place for perpetrators to commit crime. And, of course, there's always a vast resource of potential victims. And this is because while computer manufacturers and software manufacturers are trying to make things so easy for people to, to make and use, unfortunately, these very same people are also potential victims. Many times they don't know or don't understand what happens when certain things pop up and of course they'll pay whatever money to make this whole thing go away. Treads tend, tend to change very quickly in cybercrime investigations and as a result the face is constantly changing. Now cybercrime is not within the scope of this class. We do talk about it in AJS 275 criminal investigations and it's also discussed in greater depth and detail in police and service training. But generally speaking, cybercrime investigators are, for lack of a better term, and this comes from them, not from me, geeks with guns. And the typical cybercrime investigator is not going to be found at your typical department with, with 10 to 12 full-time equivalents you're usually going to see a cybercrime investigator who is going to be part of a joint task force where you're going to have both federal and state assets at work and you're dealing with things such as uh, sexual exploitation of minors, human trafficking, and so forth. And a lot of people have actually made their careers based upon a rotation in cybercrime. So it doesn't hurt you to be a little more computer literate than most. And quite frankly, you can't avoid IT or information technology just because you're in law enforcement. Law enforcement is, is very much IT oriented as any other business there is. With that, let's take a look at some at another form of investigation. Your typical your typical average department is not going to become involved in undercover operations. However, I have worked for several agencies that do become involved in undercover operations because there is usually one officer who ends up rotating through the local narcotics concept teams. And typically this involves an individual who is on a rotating assignment through uh, um, we would call them concept teams. Uh, they usually have other uh, names throughout, throughout the country. For example, there's a, there's a uh, task force that operates in Pinal County called GITM, which is a gang and, 
and Trafficking Task Force. And what they'll do is they will they will take officers from other agencies because it's a fresh face. It's some it's a face that nobody's seen before. They often put these people undercover and they're going to do things such as controlled buys or running informants, doing surveillance, things of that nature. Oftentimes these can be very rewarding because any money that comes about as a, as a drug forfeiture, a share of it will go to the agency that is participating in that drug task force. And so if you find yourself in a situation where you can participate in a drug task force, it doesn't hurt your career one bit. Colia, of course, has certain policies and procedures relative to undercover operations. Much of it has to do with ethics and things that you should and should not do. Oftentimes, undercover investigators get themselves into trouble because they take liberties with funds and informants. It's generally not worth that sort of risk. Oftentimes, these undercover operations have federal involvement, especially if it's if it's drugs. Your typical drug task force usually have a DEA agent as part of the task force. If it involves drugs and guns, or just guns, then the ATF will often assign someone to that task force, probably assign a uh, federal prosecutor, because oftentimes the people they're chasing don't stay in one place. They may cross an international border, they may cross a state line, they, they'll certainly cross a county line, and it's, it's beneficial to have someone with, with uh, jurisdiction in other areas so that you can continue to operate. And of course, it always is nice to have that federal money that's behind you too. Because oftentimes, as we've told you, as we've mentioned before, undercover operations, surveillance operations, decoy operations are extremely expensive in, in terms of time, in terms of manpower, and in terms of money. And it's always nice to have that federal money behind you so you can continue to operate in an investigation. And of course, it doesn't hurt to have resources and expertise that are available to you. Okay, so that pretty much covers uh, federal involvement in undercover operations. Oftentimes, uh, federal involvement is going to be necessary and probably not a bad idea. One of the, one of the things that federal agents get involved in, and usually in the form of a joint task force, is by bust operations. And again, this is something that a typical small agency does not get involved in unless they're part of a backup team or until or unless they have an officer assigned to a drug task force. But typically they involve an undercover officer who is uh, attempting to arrange or arrange a purchase of drugs from a suspected drug dealer. While he's doing it, typically he's not armed, or if he is armed, he's armed with something that is small and extremely concealable. And so it's, it's usually a small caliber weapon. So this makes surveillance officers, or as our authors like to call them, ghost officers, important. They're providing safety and security for that, for that officer who is actually conducting the buy. Backing up that officer is a backup team. And these are usually, if, depending on the dealer, uh, usually heavily armed, heavily armored. Uh, sometimes a SWAT team is used depending on on the level that this or the level of violence that is anticipated. And last but not least, a supervisory, a supervisory agent runs the whole thing. And typically in most undercover operations that I'm familiar with, 
that supervisor is oftentimes a federal agent or a, a very senior uh, local police officer. The one thing you have to be careful of when you're engaging in any kind of undercover operation or any kind of decoy operation is entrapment. And I'm going to discuss this very briefly because this is discussed in much greater depth and detail in AJS 260 uh, procedural criminal law. When we're talking about entrapment, and this is going to be the, the one defense that that your perpetrator is going to use, he is going to say that he was forced into it by the police. When in actuality, inducement is the key word. All you're doing, or all the police are doing, is giving someone an opportunity to commit a crime. The decision, of course, to commit that crime is with the suspect themselves. And this was articulated in Jacobson versus United States, which is a, which is a uh, Supreme Court case where Jacobson asserted that, that he was forced by law enforcement to uh, commit a crime. In actuality, law enforcement merely provided people with an opportunity to commit the crime as opposed to actually forcing people. So, if the person takes the opportunity, well, that's pretty much on them. So, to wrap up this, unit, this discussion, investigations have, have traditionally been conducted by detectives, but that's only in those departments that have detectives available. If a department did not have detectives available, either the the small department in question either called in a larger county or state agency to assist, or it simply went unsolved. Fast forward to the 1970s, and the Rand Corporation conducted a, a study which, which still brings controversy today. And that controvert or that particular report discovered that. Much of the time, detectives weren't very productive on the job. And an agency that I, w I used to work with, this was very much the case. Detectives would receive their assignments during, during a shift briefing. They would take their information, go out in the field, and usually drive to the local Sears store and go tool shopping for hours on end. And that's what they would do. Or they would not, or they would do a lot of nothing when it came to, an, to a case unless the case had some media attention behind it. And there were a lot of detectives that built their careers that way. And so as a result, many agencies reduced their detective bureaus. Repeat offender programs often identify certain people to be targets of an intensive investigation. Why? Because studies tell us that 90% of the, of the crime is committed by roughly 10% or less of the perpetrators in any given jurisdiction. And so if those people receive targeted investigation and enforcement, they would be arrested and then hopefully given an enhanced sentence to where they will no longer be a problem in the community. A number of tactics that are considered proactive rather than reactive are things such as decoy operations, stakeouts, and stings. These differ from the typical reactive or retroactive investigation where people investigate after the crime has happened. A proactive tactic is to catch the criminal as the crime is occurring or provide them with an opportunity to do so. Other traditional proactive techniques also include undercover operations. And again, the idea is to provide the criminal with an opportunity to commit crime. If he chooses to do so, that's on him. With that said, this pretty much wraps up our discussion of investigations.
Again, we talk about investigations in much greater depth and detail in AJS 275. And it's also discussed in other places. See